Good morning, everybody. Happy Easter. I'm going to play a song for you. It's called um, Ain't No Grave. I played it once before for you guys, and I'm going to try it again. That trumpet sound gonna rise right out of the ground. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Look way down the river. What do you think I see? See a band of angels and they're coming after me. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold my body down. Look down yonder, Gabriel, put your feet on land and sea. Gabriel, don't you blow your trumpet till you hear from me. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Ain't no grave can hold down. Meet me, Jesus, meet me, meet me in the middle of the air. If these wings don't fail me, meet you anywhere. There ain't no grave can hold my heart down. There ain't no grave can hold my heart down. Mother and father, meet me on the river road. Mommy, you know I'll be there when I'm checking in my load. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. There ain't no grave can hold my body down. Good morning. Happy Easter. It's funny. The person who came up with the phrase, in like a lion, out like a lamb, never lived in northern Michigan. But it made me think about how Jesus was a lamb of God. Today is being Easter, the last day of March. It is appropriate. Uh, welcome to Petoskey United Methodist Church, to all of those who are worshiping here in person, and also those who are joining us via the internet. My name is Bryn Coy Burt. I'm really privileged to serve as your liturgist this morning. Wanted to call your attention to the red folders that are in the pews um, closest to the center aisle. If you could please pass those on, add your name, and then pass them back. It's just our way of getting to know each other better. Not as expected. Last week, we learned of those who heard of the King of the Jews arriving, and those who had never met him expected pomp, circumstance, riches, big scene. Instead, they witness simplicity. However, the crowd's reaction to him was exactly the same. Overwhelming joy and hope didn't matter what they saw. Their reaction was just huge. And that got me thinking about what did the disciples expect to see on Good Friday? I mean, I know that they were told by Jesus exactly what was going to happen. But because at the time that they were being told they didn't understand, they weren't able to hold on to that knowledge. Uh, so they didn't have the answer in their head as this was all taking place. When you think of Friday to Sunday morning, that's a long time. I mean, were they expecting him to heal himself instantly the way that he had everybody up until then? Um, the man who needed to have help walking, he didn't start walking three days later after he saw Jesus. He started walking like right away. So it must have been a really dark time in between Friday and Sunday. And it kind of think, oh, it got me thinking about how, why didn't they understand what Jesus was trying to tell them? 
And then being a parent of a teenager, I kind of did finally get the answer where, like, how many times have we told our kids something that we wanted to pass on to them, some piece of knowledge, only to be replied with, like, the eye roll and the not understanding until they actually do go through that situation that we were warning them about. And then they understood, and they come back to you with thanks. So thankfully, since the beginning of our lives, we've always known the end of this story and how it began a new one, one of hope for all mankind from the beginning to the end. So if you'd like to join with me to the call of worship, it's written in your bulletins and on the screen. Uh, when all hope seems lost, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. When fear hovers close at hand, Christ is risen. When disillusionment and despair threaten us, Christ is risen. Come, celebrate the risen Lord. Alleluia. And if you'd like to join me with the opening prayer. When everything was dark and it seemed that the sun would never shine again, your love broke through. Your love was too strong, too wide, too deep for death to hold. The sparks cast by your love dance and spread and burst forth with resurrection light. Gracious God, we praise you for the light of new life made possible through Jesus. We praise you for the light of new life that shone on the first witnesses of this resurrection. We praise you for the light of new life that continues to shine in our hearts today. We pray that the Easter light of life, hope, and joy will live in us each day and that we will be bearers of that light into the lives of others. Amen. And now if you would like to join us with songs, Kings of Kings and Amazing Grace. I'd like to invite everyone to stand if you if you like so able and then join in in singing all, as well. Or if not, then just please just let the song lead you deeper into worship on this Easter day. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
may be seated. Today's scripture comes from the, chapter, or the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus, and they didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming, bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces towards the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all of these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb. When he bent over to look inside, he only saw the linen cloth. And then he returned home, wondering what had happened. I'm not, by the way, sure of how Easter became about bunnies and candies and herb scissors, but it did the real story of Easter is Jesus came down to earth, taught us to help the poor, love our enemies, and so we killed him. And <laughs> then he came back. Why he came back, I don't know. It's not like we made him feel very welcome, but that's the story. <laughs> And I wonder if children even know that. So we went on a Hollywood Boulevard where kids were enjoying spring break and asked them, what is the meaning of Easter? Here it is. Can you tell me the story of Easter? Um, uh, uh, the first Easter. Ooh. You got toys? What kind of toys? Lego. Jesus rose from the dead? What happened with Jesus on Easter? He made a bunny. I think he um, led some people somewhere. Who were his like main friends? Uh, his disciples. The bad guys killed him. The Romans, I think it was. He got like pinned to a, to a cross. He did this. Everybody was watching, and then, um, and yeah, and then sooner or later he died. What did he die of? Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Drugs. He was put into a cave with a rock. He was in heaven, um, working on his project. Then he, then he came down to see the bunny. What project was Jesus working on? A computer? He made a promise that he will come back on Easter. It took three days and two angels to come and move for Bolo. And Jesus was alive. When Jesus came back, he gave people Easter eggs. He said, Bunny, please, please don't hide the Easter eggs. What did the people say when Jesus came back? What did Jesus do when he came back to life? <laughs> that is really actually up to you. Well, good morning and happy Easter. I'm Pastor Julie. We're so happy that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Well, these kids were not the only ones who weren't sure what the Easter story was all about. We pick up our story today where we left off last week. Jesus had traveled from Galilee where he had gained popularity and quite a following. And he comes to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And as he entered Jerusalem, he was welcomed like a king. And so last Sunday, Palm Sunday, we remember that welcome that Jesus received where they waved palms and put their cloaks and the palms on the ground for him to enter into the city as if he was a king. 
However, as the week went on, tensions heightened, and the religious leaders became increasingly threatened by Jesus, to the point that they eventually plot to have him killed. On Thursday of that week, after celebrating what was believed to be the Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And it was there that soldiers sent by the religious leaders came to arrest Jesus. On Friday night, the religious leaders brought Jesus before Pilate, the Roman governor, and they accused him of treason in hopes that Pilate would have him killed. But Pilate realized that Jesus wasn't guilty, and he tries to save Jesus, but the crowds are now against him, and they demand that he be crucified. And so Jesus was sent to death, or sentenced to death, crucified, and died about 3 p.m. that day just hours before the Sabbath would begin. Joseph and Nicodemus, who were part of the Sanhedrin, which was the judicial body um, that was in charge of um, keeping the religious laws, the group that had just sentenced Jesus or condemned him to death, they asked Pilate if they could get Jesus' body so that they might bury him because they were also secretly followers of Jesus. But the men didn't really have time for a proper burial before the beginning of the Sabbath. Proper burial would have included washing the body and anointing it with oil and wrapping it in cloth. And so instead, they covered the body with 75 pounds of spice in order to try to offset the smell of decay and to help preserve the body. And they laid Jesus in a garden tomb until he could properly really be attended to after the Sabbath. And that's where our passage picks up today. In the Gospel of Luke, the women went to the tomb on Sunday morning at sunrise, which marked the end of the Sabbath, right, the earliest point in time in which they could return. And they brought spices to anoint Jesus' body to complete the embalming process and to show further respect. But when they arrived, they noticed that the tomb in front of, of the, or the stone in front of the tomb had been rolled away. And when, when they went into the tomb, they found that Jesus' body was no longer there. The writer of Luke tells us that they didn't know what to make of this. When suddenly two men appear with gleaming bright clothing and they announce to the women, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has, but has raised... Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, but on the third day would rise again. So they immediately go and tell the disciples, who of course just think the women are full of nonsense. But Peter decides, well, maybe there's something to what they say. And so he went to check for himself to see if the body is there. When it isn't, he is equally confused about what it all means. Even though the women had just told him what the angels had said to them, even though Jesus had been trying to tell them throughout his ministry, especially the latter part of his ministry, what was about to occur. All the Gospels have this account of the empty tomb. There are slightly different details and slightly different events that occur in each Gospel, but there are also things that are consistent. It's consistent that it's always the women who find the tomb empty. It's not just a made-up story, but consistent across all of these tellings of the story. And in the time, women would not have had equal standing as men. If you think about the Gospels, they're mostly left out of the Gospels. They concentrate on the 12 male disciples, mostly leaving out all of the accomplishments and support of the women that were there helping Jesus throughout his ministry. The second thing that's consistent is that there's always confusion and uncertainty. They're not sure what it all meant or why it happened. Even though Jesus had told them all along, when it actually happens, they don't understand. And N.T. Wright, one of the great modern-day theologians, argues that even today most people are unclear what Jesus was about, why his life, death, and resurrection are important. 
For many, the main message of Jesus was simply to share good advice. So often, churches reduce the Christian faith to good advice, how to live or how to be a better person, how to be a better husband or wife or how to be financially responsible or how to get to heaven, um, right? What you have to do or what you have to say or what's the minimal entry requirement or that it's maybe sort of like a party and Peter is the bouncer who decides who gets in and who doesn't, right? So how do we get past the bouncer? But nobody gets crucified for good advice. It wasn't Jesus' advice that led led him to death on the cross. It's true that Jesus shared a lot of good advice, but that wasn't the main point. Jesus came to announce good news. Somebody else is announcing good news too. It's time. You're here on time. Good news is not advice. It's not, it's an announcement. It's a particular announcement that something significant has happened. That somehow the world has changed and it's different than it was before. So what was this good news that Jesus came to share? The Gospel of Mark in the first chapter, verses 14 and 15, states it this way. Jesus came to Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. In the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 43, I must preach the good news of God's kingdom in other cities too, for this is why I was sent. The Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 23rd verse. Jesus traveled through Galilee teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus sent the disciples out to proclaim God's kingdom. And then in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 3, after the death and the resurrection, um, it says this, we're told, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. Right? The good news that Jesus had to announce was that God's kingdom was coming. That God's kingdom would be different than the kingdoms of this world. Unlike the current rulers of the world who operate out of threats and bullying, who are focused on gaining power and money, who concentrate on their self-interest and their egos. In God's kingdom, evil is destroyed and love and justice and peace prevail. Jesus is announcing that God's kingdom is coming here on earth. The biblical story really begins with God creating the world and he creates the world out of love and a desire to be in relationship with us. But we then choose to disobey God, believing that we somehow know better than God. If you remember the story of Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. There is no pain or suffering or sin or evil. And they're asked to not eat from one tree in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then the serpent tells Adam and Eve that they'll be able to tell the difference between good and evil on their own if they eat from the tree. Right? They'll know better. They don't need God. They can figure it out themselves. And we continue to do the same. We make our own kingdoms instead instead of living in the kingdom that God has made for us. The kingdom that is good and not evil. That doesn't have pain and suffering. A kingdom that's full of love and justice and peace. As the biblical story continues, we hear how God raises up the Israelites to be a blessing to all the nations that they might rescue the world. But the Israelites stray from God. And God doesn't give up. He continues to work through the Israelites, sending judges and prophets to draw them back to God. But when that fails, God promises then to send a Savior, a Messiah, who would help us get back on track and put the world right. Jesus is that promise realized. Through Jesus' life, people could see for the first time God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, announcing that heaven is coming down here on earth. In Christ's death, we see evil in its fullest, don't we? 
God comes to us in Jesus in order to help us to know who we are and who we were created to be. So that we would know God's love for us and desire to be back in relationship with God. So that we could live life fully as it was meant to be. But instead of embracing Jesus, we crucify him on a cross. But sin and death and pain and suffering, they didn't have the last word. Because today we gather and we celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection that launched God's new kingdom, which Jesus invites us all to be a part of. The hope of the resurrection is not just about going to heaven. Right? I think many people view the story of Jesus without connecting it to this backstory of the Jewish faith. They limit the meaning of the resurrection. They see Jesus' resurrection as proof that there's life after death, as proof that God is, um, that Jesus is God's son, or that in our uncertainty as to whether we're going to heaven or hell, Jesus' resurrection gives us hope that we're heavenly bound. And it's not that these things aren't true. But it makes the purpose of the resurrection sound like it's just to escape creation. The creation that God made and called good. Or people view the story simply as being about Jesus dying for our sins and taking our punishment. Which I always think makes God seem like an angry God who needs someone to suffer and die for the sins of our doing. Rather than a God who loves us and yearns to be in relationship with us. Who would become incarnate and take the form of a human being and even die to demonstrate that love. And hope that that love would transform our hearts and bring us back to God. The resurrection is more than just hope of going to heaven or taking on our punishment. It fulfills God's covenant. It marks evil being defeated at the beginning of a new creation of love and peace and justice. It demonstrates God's love, a love that has the ability to transform this world into heaven. It says that God is alive and active in the world. That in a world when we look around and see so much evil and destruction and we wonder where God is, the resurrection tells us God is here. God hasn't forgotten us. God has never forgotten us. It tells us that one day that God will finish God's task and everything will be transformed and rectified and the healing love of God will make everything right. It tells us that something powerful, though, is happening now in this time between those events in you and me. That through us, God is working and transforming our lives and transforming the world into God's kingdom here and now. Right? Every time we extend Christ-like love to somebody, every time we reconcile a relationship or forgive someone or serve someone else, or every time we care for the poor or the sick or provide a, me a meal for the needy. Whenever our congregation works together to grow produce in our community garden that helps to feed people who are insecure in our community, the kingdom of God is coming here and now. When we donate to Manna and Northman Den, who we partner with so that there, there is food for our uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers and our families in this community, the kingdom of God comes closer. When we support the Harbor Hall car washes that happen every Saturday throughout the warmer months of the year, <laughs> that support the recovering addicts in our community. When we share the good news, helping to transform lives. One of the ways that we are actively seeking to transform our world into God's kingdom currently in our community is there is this dream within our congregation to start an after-school program this fall. 
So some of you might have heard that um, the YMCA is discontinuing their after school program and they serve about 80 to 100 kids now who won't have after school care without that program. And so there's a dream in this congregation that we could be a place that provides child care and a nurturing Christian environment for kids in our community. But we need help doing it. And so um, Lonnie and Lynette are sort of spearheading this. Um, and so if you'd like to be a part of this, we just invite you to connect with them or to connect with me after church or in this upcoming week. Right? The kingdom of Christ that, that Christ came to announce that led him to the cross that began in his resurrection, it's breaking into the world. It's breaking into the world when we, we love Christ and we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. When we show Christ like love and we serve Christ in the world, because in the process we're transformed and the world around us is transformed into the kingdom of God. And that was what was so threatening about Jesus. Jesus. It wasn't about the afterlife. It wasn't about forgiveness of sins. It was about changing this world to be like God's kingdom. And this is the Easter story. It's the good news of heaven coming here right now through you and me. So if you would, please pray with me. Lord God, we give you thanksgiving for this Sunday and this time to gather and to worship you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in and through us. That we would begin to be transformed by your love. A love that was so deep that you would become incarnate in Jesus. That you would walk amongst us. That you would teach and heal us. That you would even go as far as dying on a cross for us. So that we would know how deeply you love us. And how deeply you want to be in relationship with us. And we pray Lord that this morning that we would just feel your spirit. We would take heed of your invitation to be in relationship with you. That we would allow your love to just flow over us and transform our lives. That we might live according to your purposes. And that in the transformation of our lives, we begin to transform this world into your kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus came to announce. That when we turned on the news, none of the pain and the suffering that we see would be anymore. But rather, we would love you and love one another deeply, as you intended us to do. We pray this, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We'd like to play this great old, great old hymn.